With over 15 million books sold in the United States alone, more than four dozen books to his credit, and numerous game credits, Bob, yes, you can call him Bob, um, has become one of the most important figures in, in modern epic fantasy. He's probably most well known for his iconic Forgotten Realms character, the dark elf Drist Dawarden, whose story close continues now. in his newest book. I'm getting close, like I said, I'm, I'm the Star Wars <laughs> fan, um, just coming in by proxy. The third volume in the Neverwinter Saga, Charon's Claw. Um, please join me in welcoming him to Authors at Google. We'll have time for some Q&A at the end, and I present to you Bob. It's good to be here. Uh, great place. I was a little blown away coming in. I, was, I, I texted my friend who was using my Red Sox tickets with his kids today, and I said, uh, hey, I'm at Google. And he goes, what do you mean you're at Google? I said, I'm at Google. And, you know, holy crap. You should see this place. And he's like, what are you doing at Google? I said, I'm doing an event. He goes, are you searching for things? I'm like, no, 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 no. Anyway, it is good to be here. Um, yeah, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a little bit what's going on and, and really open it up for questions. We could talk about anything. We could talk about Star Wars. We could talk about the Dark Elf books. We could talk about 38 Studios, Big Sad. But I could talk a little bit about that before the lawyers get me. Um, this book, amazing thing happened to me a couple of years ago when I was doing the collected stories of Dritz and all the Forgotten Realm stories I had written. And when I was writing them, I mean, when I was doing the book, putting them together, I had to read all the stories again because they wanted it annotated. They wanted me to say what I, why I wrote this story. What was the point of this story? And so as I'm rereading all of these stories, I, every time I would read one, it would put me right back in the time and place I was when I wrote it. And that's when I realized that what I'm really doing here over all these years is it's almost like this is my journey and I'm just using the books to ask myself all the questions that everybody asks themselves. I'm using the characters as my sounding boards for all of that. So this is a very cool epiphany for me that, that this isn't like my job. This is the journey of my life, um, which is kind of scary, too, I think. And then the other thing I realized as I was going through it from the, from the letters I continually get is what these books have become for a lot of people who have been reading them for many, many years now is kind of a lifeline back to maybe a simpler time in their lives. You know, there's a, there's a great quote when they had, they had a pro hockey player and they were talking about where hockey was. And they said, what is, the, what is the golden age of hockey? And he looked at the guy and he shrugged and he said, when you were 12. And I think that's true. It doesn't matter what year it was, when you were 12. And so for a lot of people, I think when they read these books and they open up the next Dark Elf book, it just puts them back to 1989 or 1992 or 1995 or whatever when they were playing Dungeons and Dragons with their friends. So it's almost like a lifeline home for a lot of people. And it is for me as well when I'm writing. Um, so there's been, there's been a couple of cool epiphanies that have happened as we've gone through. And, so a few, and, and the other thing is, last month, July, marked um, 25 years ago, last month, July 1987 is when I started writing The Crystal Shard. It, 25 years ago last month is when Dritz was born, essentially. It's been that long. I'm old. Um, and it's very cool that, it, that it's still going, still going strong. Um, so anyway, a few years ago, Wizards of the Coast asked me, um, you're going to be anywhere near, near Neverwinter with your next book. And I'm usually in that area with my books because that's where the cities I use, Luskin, Icewind Dale is there. The, the cities and the areas I usually use in the books are in that part of this vast Forgotten Realms world. So I said, sure, why? And they said, well, <clears throat> Cryptic Studios is doing Neverwinter Nights 3, a new computer game. that will be coming out soon. And, you know, are there some things you could do in your books to, um, to help them get the region the way they need it for the computer game? <laughs> and I said... Well, what does that mean exactly? And I said, well, basically, can you blow up Neverwinter? And I was so excited because in the shared world, you rarely get to blow up cities. So I got to blow up Neverwinter, and it was very cool. And um, then the other thing, it, and this is when you work shared world, this is the fun part of it, right? Because now, as I'm writing the book, I've got all these bad guys and all these heroes and all this fighting going on. And there's always one or two characters that you know, you can either kill or leave for another adventure, right? Uh, the recurring characters. And, and I had a couple of really, really kind of bad villains that I liked. And they, they didn't really have to die. So I got in touch with Cryptic and I said, okay, do you, you know, I can kill this character 
or I can leave her alive if you want to put her in the game. What do you think? And they're like, oh, leave her alive, leave her alive. So it was this back and forth. And, and that's the way writing is now because of the multimedia, because everything has changed. And everything really has changed. Um, two years ago, I track, I was, in the, I was in finance. I was a financial analyst when I, all of a sudden, writing found me. My, and I had published books and things. And I retired in like 1990 to just be a writer. But I track all the books. Like, the publishers hate me. Because if my check is a buck fifty short, I know. And I let them know that I know. Um, but so one of the things I've been tracking lately is electronic book sales. Now, my backlist is pretty huge. It's, it, there's a lot of books out there on backlist. You know, th this book right here is the 33rd, I think, book I've written in the Forgotten Realms. Like the 25th about this character, um, which is really weird. But anyway. Um, Two years ago, 2% of my backlist sales were electronic books. The year after that, it was 19%. First half of this year, it was 41%. And now it's over 50. So it's, it's just incredible. You know, the world's changing. And just a, I had a, an interesting contract negotiation a couple of years ago. And the publisher was trying to play hardball with me. And they said, they want, instead of doing the old, the old formula for books is royalties, right? They sell the books and they give you royalties. They wanted to go to profit sharing. And I'm smarter than that because I worked in finance. Profit sharing means they never show a profit. And so I was resisting and we had this big argument going on. And they said, but more and more of the books are going e-books. And you should, you, know, you should want profit sharing. And with e-books, profit sharing makes more sense. And I said, OK, we can do it for just the e-books. They said, yeah, but if 95% of our sales will become e-books. And you're going to wish that you had done this contract for profit sharing. And I said, if 95% of the sales become e-books, why exactly do I need you? And the whole tone of that conversation <laughs> changed. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, always, I always find that like, amazing as to the changes that are going on in the world and, and, and with the video games, working with a video game company, working with a, a game company. And uh, Wizards of the Coast, for example, now is coming out with um, another version of Dungeons & Dragons which I really love, because they're, they're throwing it back quite a bit to what it was. Fourth edition, they're, up, they're already up to fourth edition, which is really five editions. Um, and fourth edition was a dramatic change. And it really became a tactical game more than a role-playing game in fourth edition. And a lot of people didn't like that. So they're coming up with a new edition that allows you to still play that way if you want, but it's really a throwback. And whenever you're working in a shared world like that, when things like that happen to the world, you have to be a part of it. You know, you have to, because the books are how we tell the story of the world. And if they're changing the game, it's going to make changes in the world. So you've got to be on your toes when you're doing these shared world things. Um, I've increased my pace. The next book after this one will be out in March of next year instead of a year away. Um, well, basically what happened is I was working with a video game company for several years, uh, 38 Studios. I created the world for them. 38 Studios had this spectacular collapse a couple of months ago. So that's all done. And so I threw myself more into the Forgotten Realms for the next year while I clear my head. Um, some of you may know my other work. I've done Demon Wars books, which I love that world. And I did The Highwayman. I'm happy because The Highwayman just came out on audio from a company called Graphic Audio. And when they do audio books, they don't just have someone reading it. They have a bunch of actors. And it's like a they call it a movie in your mind. And it really is. And I just listened to The Highwayman. It was very cool. It just came out. Um, and you know, as I try to figure out whether I'm going back to Demon Wars, whether I'm doing the Highwayman books or whether I'm doing more Demon War books set in the other zone, while I'm doing all of that and clearing my head, I'm just throwing myself into the Forgotten Realms. So I've got this book, uh, Karen's Claw, just came out. It's the third of four in the Neverwinter Saga. The fourth book's going to be in March. Uh, in between that, in October, I did three books. They were young adult books, but they're really Dritz books, with my son. And they came out a couple of years ago. But in October, all three are coming out in a single volume. And, and the other thing we're doing is comics. I'm now writing Dritz Comics, which is a slightly different way to look at everything. And, I, and it, it's very cool. So I'm having a lot of fun. It's been a lot of years, you know, 25 years doing this. And, and, it, and really not slowing down. I'm actually going faster, which is kind of incredible to me. Um, so with that, uh, I think I've covered everything coming in the near future. Um, I'll, I'll open it up to questions. Like I said, I could talk about anything, just about, even about the writing process, if anyone has writing, you know, a writer, and they want to talk about it. 
Oh, they're going to get formal with this. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, we can talk about Star Wars. We can talk about 38 Studios even, and or just about the writing process if you, if you're a writer or. Do you have any idea what's going to happen with uh, the IP from 38 Studios? That's the 21 million dollar question, isn't it? Um, is it I, interesting to you? Is that something you'd want to? Of course. I mean, look, here's what happened. In 2006, I'm sitting at my house. I got a phone call. I'm a Red Sox fan, and it, I pick up the phone. A guy on the other end says, "Can I talk to Bob Salvatore?" This is speaking. He goes, "Oh man, I can't believe I'm talking to you. You're my favorite author. This is Kurt Schilling." I was like, screw you, you know? And, it, and my wife's laughing at me because his publicist had called earlier and she knew it really was him. Uh. And so when I finally figure out it's him, I'm like, I can't believe I'm talking to you, bloody sock guy. I, I can't believe I'm talking to you. Like, I can't believe I'm talking to you. So we did that for about 20 minutes. <laughs> and then he explained to me that, you know, he's getting ready to retire and he didn't want to go sell insurance. And he should have, apparently. But he didn't want to go sell insurance. And what he really loved were video games. A big EverQuest player, big World of Warcraft player. He wanted to start a video game company, and he wanted me to create the world for it. And it turns out we live like an hour apart. Um, he had no idea I even lived in Massachusetts, but I'm, I'm like an hour from him. And where we put our first office in, in Maynard, Mass, was like halfway between our houses. Um, so I came in, and I, I didn't want, it was a startup company. And video games were expensive. So I didn't want to take any money up front at all. I didn't get paid. But I worked with the team. I, I created the world of Amalur and the, the entire, like, this 10,000-year history working with the team for this world. And, you know, as it went on, my job was pretty much done by 2009. You know, and after that part, I, point, I just became, I had two roles. I was an editor for all of the narrative guys working at 38 Studios and the content team and all of that. And I would work with the art team to make sure the art fit, you know, what I was thinking of when I was, when I was creating it. And then I was part of the dog and pony show that went to the conventions, essentially, and sold the IP to the, to, you know, to the people to go out there and just talk it up. And um, so I never got anything. And the only way that I'm ever going to, for four years of work, the only way I ever recoup anything, but even more important than that, the only way I protect my name, if that IP gets sold, is to become a part of it, again, with whoever buys it. And EA just signaled the other day that they really want to publish a, a uh, Reckoning 2. Reckoning did really well. It sold like 1.3 million or something. For a new IP on a brand new engine, that's not bad. Of like a, a character that has no predetermined fate, did that play out a lot in the 10,000 year history? No, that was actually something Big Huge Games brought to the table. Uh, the idea of reckoning you're fated, or everyone is fated, except this one guy is not. And that was something Big Huge Games brought to the table, but we always argued about that. Because see, I never looked at it that the people were fated. What that whole world meant to me was that because of the, the things that were going on with magic at the time, so if you're a cobbler's son and you're, you're making shoes all day, right? You're being trained to make shoes. The magic would reinforce that. So you become really good at making shoes because of the, this is the time of heightened magic. And they interpreted that to be your fated. And I always thought of fate in the world during that very small slice of time. You know, this was 2,500 years before the MMO. But fate in the world was more like the opiate of the masses. So the, the kings loved it, right? And the landowners loved it because it's keeping everybody, you know, you're a cobbler's son. You have to be a cobbler. You can't usurp my throne, right? So it was like that, that's what fate became in that world, essentially. And that's the way I always looked at it. That was an ongoing argument between, you know, my side of it and the other side of it. And that's what made, that's what made working for that company so much fun is that we would fight all the time. But in a good way. I mean, a respectful debate with lots of swear words. It was fun. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that, that, I thought we could have done more with it in the game than we did, but we were going to, now we're not, but <laughs> yeah. 
Can you talk more about uh, working in the shared world and how much of it you actually get to drive? It sounds like with Neverwinter currently, you were sort of doing your own thing and then got approached, but I feel like Drizzt and Elminster in particular are sort of the main plot, quote unquote, of the realms to a large extent. So how much of that do you drive proactively and what's the process like for that versus how much is you writing and informing people and how does it all work? Yeah, the, uh, it depends who is working. I've gone through so many different over 25 years, so many different teams up at Wizards of the Coast. So it depends who's there at the time and the way they're doing it. But generally speaking, what I've done in this vast shared world is hide. You know, I stay off in the corners. I, I remember when I first set the first book, you know, I've got this. First, I thought they wanted me on the Moonshe Isles. That's an entirely different story. But when I found out I had this vast world and I had to set a book in it, I said, oh, this area looks good. I want to be here. And, Oh, no, that's Cormare, and that's where Ed's going to be working with his Elminster books. And I go, well, how about here? Well, that's the Bloodstone Lands and Doug Niles up there. And well, how about down here? Oh, no, no, that's Calumshan, and we're doing this game product down there. And he's got this giant map, and every place is filled up. And I finally looked at the map, and they had these mountains up top, and there was this little strip of land. And I said, see that little typo between the mountains and the sea of moving ice? Yeah, is anyone there? No, that's Icewind Dale. Leave me alone. And so I spent most of my time hiding. Of course, from there I went underground to, the dark, to create the Dark Elf race in the world. And by the way, that was, that was a trip because after I, when I finished The Halfling's Gem, which was the third book of that series, I, the fourth book I had planned was going to send my heroes back to recapture this dwarven homeland. And TSR, it was TSR back then, this was before Wizards of the Coast, called me up and said, you know, we think people are sick of these characters. So just tie it up in this book and we'll go do something else. And that was 1990, and we're still writing them, so they were wrong. And so I agreed, and I tied it up in that book, and then all of a sudden I got a call, you know, we're getting a lot of letters about this dark elf guy, so maybe we should do a series about where he came from. And so I thought that would be great. And I had these old modules by Gary Gygax, um, Descent to the Depths of the Earth, you know, you remember the classic, the ones that followed the Giant series, right? Um, Descent to the Depths of the Earth, Queen of the Spiderweb Pits, uh, you know, and I... So I took these old modules, and they had all this information about Dark Elves, just a little bit here and there. And the Fiend Folio, one of the first edition monster books, had just come out. And they had like a one-page entry on Dark Elves. And so I, I had all of that. I gathered all of that, and I'm reading it, and I'm like, ooh, that's not a lot. So I called up the TSR, and I said, okay, I've got, you know, I've got all these things. What else are you going to send me? And they said, that's all there is. And I said, wait a minute, what are you talking about here? And they said, oh, no, we're, we're giving you carte blanche, you're going to create the Dark Elves in the Forgotten Realms. Okay. Um, so I went and I got out one of my favorite books of all time, The Godfather, Mario Puzo's The Godfather. And that is the, that is the basis for the structure of the Dark Elven city. Well, that and the fact that I have five older sisters. <laughs> They always come up to me and say, I'm the good one, right? There really isn't any good one. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's where, and that's where it came from. But I, I've spent so much time hiding. And, and it always, we always get in trouble when they pull me out because of, when I was doing the um, Thousand Orcs, they said, you know, you're hiding too much, but we need you to do more with the realms. So, you know, can you use some characters from the campaign setting? And so I'm looking through, and I'm finding characters that fit like King O'Bould many arrows of the orcs. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. Can I use him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, look, I'm warning you. If I use him, I can kill him. Yeah, of course, of course, no problem. So I write the book, and I send it in, and my editor's like, oh, we got a problem. I'm like, well, what's the problem? Well, on the timeline, your, your book is actually set before the campaign setting. So you can't kill them. Like, wait a minute. And this always happens because you have so many hands in this giant pot, you know? And with Neverwinter, I was, I'm always happy to do that. I'm always happy to play with others in this sandbox as long as it's not going to hinder what I wanted to do. And there was a real, I have a reason for writing all of these books. There's something that I want to explore. And with the new books, uh, Gauntel Grimm through the book that's coming in March, for most of the books, my main character is surrounded by people of similar wheel, right? Any one of that group, Caddy, Bree, Bruno, Regis, Wolfgar, and Dritz, any one of them would take an arrow that was aimed for somebody else. And now here's my main character, and he's alone, he's depressed, the world's gone dark, 
It's all cynicism. He's wondering if his whole life and his entire moral code was nothing but a sad joke after all. And now he's surrounded by people who not only wouldn't take the arrow aimed for him, but would pull him in front of them to block the arrow. And so the, it's like the kid you know in high school falls in with the wrong crowd, or if you have a friend who starts dating someone and they're getting serious, you know this person's really bad for him, but there's nothing you can do about it, and you can only hope that they're going to lift this person up instead of getting dragged down, right? And that's what, that was the story of the Neverwinter Saga. And then they just said, so for the icing on the cake, can you blow up a city? <laughs> yep. Can you add some characters to the city? Yep, I can do that. And when it works like that, it's awesome. Shared world is awesome. Because you're standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, best example of that, I'm writing Streams of Silver, the second book. And I've got to get from Icewind Dale, go about a quarter of the way across the world to the Silver Marches. And I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do. It, you know, when you're doing a travel book, with, it, it's hard to, you don't have a random encounter table like you do in the game. So it's hard to make it interesting. And there was this one town along the way called Long Saddle. And so I looked at my gray box set, the 25-year-old Forgotten Realms box set, and this was 24 years ago. So, um, And they, they talk about this town, and all it said was that Long Saddle is ruled by a family of eccentric wizards who reside in the Ivy Mansion. That's like all it said. So I'm like, now, the, now the wheels start turning. How can I make this fun? And so I come up with the Harples. I think it said the Harples, but I came up with like the, main, the actual characters. And I started having them do really goofy things, like the wizard's house was surrounded by an invisible wall. And so every day someone would have to come up and scrape the birds off it. Right? And, and one guy turned him, he, he, he had this brilliant spell that would turn him into a statue. And he had another spell to take him out without realizing that he wouldn't, once he turned into a statue, he couldn't do the other spell. So he's standing there. And they had a bridge that you don't walk over, you walk under, right? It's all these weird, stupid things. And it was so much fun. And I called Ed Greenwood up. And Ed Green was the guy who created the Forgotten Realms when he was eight years old. And that's true. Um, and I said, Ed, I want to read you what I have about Long Saddle. What do you think? And we just had the best time going back and forth about that. That's when Shared World works, and it is so much fun. I'm really curious about like, the writing process. I am not a writer. I've never been a writer. My dad taught English at high school. Uh, but I, I've always wanted to write and never been able to. Um, but I'm curious about how you actually go about writing. It sounds like you're much more structured about how you approach the story. You sort of figure out the... The, the arcs and the small arcs, and then you fill in the details. Um, um, whereas, yeah. like, for example, Terry Pratchett, I've heard talk, and he said he just goes into his office and he writes 500 words a day, like boom, boom, yep. boom, every day, yep. and just comes up with a, the story just emerges. It sounds like you're much more structured and, and <laughs> I planning you. full. Um, no, here's what I do. I, I, I have to do an outline for a few reasons. Well, whether I'm doing shared world or my own books, I have a lot of books in my own worlds where I can blow up everything, right? And... I have to do an outline. The publishers demand an outline because they want to know you're actually thinking about it and working. So I, I write my outline. I send it in because I want to get paid. And then I start writing, and I throw the outline away. And the characters, the characters tell me what's next. And I often don't know. I am, I am often shocked at things that happen in the books. They surprise me all the time. You know, at oops, I accidentally just killed that person. Oh, wait a minute, you know. It, it, this is the way it works. And I think I, I think I write the books the way other people read books. And that's what makes it fun for me. Without that, it'd be boring. Now, there are times when it doesn't work like that. Um, Star Wars. Um, you have to tell them exactly what you're going to do in Star Wars. And I remember when I, when I was signed on to do Vector Prime, the infamous one, um, you know, I, I wrote the outline and I sent it in and I'm in a conference call with Lucasfilm and Del Rey. And, uh, you know, they, they're, oh, this is great. This is exactly what we want. They had told me the overview of this new Jedi Order, like A to Z. And I was supposed to go A to B or A to C. And I had certain things, beat points I had to hit and I had to leave everything in a certain way. I just had to come up with a story that made it through those beat points. And they go, this is great. This is exactly what we wanted. But didn't anyone tell you? And I said, what? You have to kill Chewbacca. And I was like, next words came out of my mouth I'm never going to say on camera. But it wasn't nice. 
Um, oh no, this is from this is from on high. The Wookie gets it, <laughs> and um, so that was much more structured, working in Star Wars. Uh, but no, I, I they tell me that's what makes it fun. Uh, just a quick supplementary question: Were you actually ever a dungeon master? Oh, I still am. Oh, okay. I just started running a game again. Every, and it's funny because my son was running, so we're playing fourth edition. As soon as I take over, we're playing first edition again. That's my edition. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I've been playing since 1980. Uh, if you want to have some fun, uh, just, just kind of an insight into my, my D&D, what they're like, my D&D sessions. A few years ago, I addressed uh, Mythic. At the, Mythic was doing the Warhammer game. At, they were doing Dark Age Camelot at that time. And I was at their round table in Las Vegas. And I told a story called Wubba Wubba. So if you get some time, go to YouTube and look up uh, Salvatore Wubba Wubba. And it's about a wand of wonder in my group and what happened. And it's, it's pretty, it, if you're a gamer, you're a get, you'll get it. If you're a gamer, you'll get it. Yeah. So you mentioned a number of ways in which new media is kind of changing things for you and, and for the industry. How does the majority, now that the majority and going towards are, are on eBooks, how does that change the dynamic of book signings? I sign a lot of Kindles. No, the book signings haven't changed a lot. They've actually gotten bigger because of social media. Because if I'm going somewhere now, it's real easy to let you know, the 100,000 people know like that, right? Um, so the, the, the signings have gotten a little bigger, but people still like, especially the hardcovers. And the book signings are really only for hardcover books. That's when you go out. You don't go out when the paperback comes out. You go out when the hardcover comes out. And people like having that. And you know. As much as ebooks are convenient, especially if you're like going to go, if you're on vacation, right? You're not going to pack 10 books. But if, you, if you've got your Kindle and you start reading a book and you don't like it, you just pfft, go to the next book. Or if you get your Nook or whatever reader you're using, right? So there, there's a lot of convenience there. But to me, that hardcover, particularly a hardcover book, but paperbacks too, they're really a piece of furniture. And if you've got that bookshelf in your house, that's a statement about who you are. So people come in and they look at that bookshelf, and that's like an icebreaker. You know, if, if, you're, if you're a fan of, of, of my books, for example, and somebody comes over and they see that you've got the Crystal Shard and the Dark Elf trilogy and all this, that's like a connection. They're not going to go through your Kindle and see what's on there. Now it's like an invasion of privacy, right? <laughs> but so people still buy hardcovers, and the book signings haven't changed all that much. Um, I'm sure that... Except, well, one thing I do on my website, I have a rasalvatore.com. It's a cool story. A guy, back when the internet was first coming big, I, was getting, I got this letter from this kid in high school, basically, and he's like, remember when people were buying domain names or getting the domain names and then selling them back to people for lots of money? And um, this guy writes to me and he goes, I own rasalvatore.com. And I went, oh, here it comes. And he said, I'm going to give it to you for nothing if you look at this website I set up for you. Just come look at it, and I'll just give you the domain name. I just bought it because I was afraid someone would buy it and try to blackmail you. I'm thinking, well, this is a cool kid, right? And I went, and he, and he had a really good website. And so I let him keep the name. And we do things called e-signings through the website. And I actually have the copyright on the term e-signing. I actually copyrighted it to me because I thought this is going to be a big thing. And so what happens is, People order the book through my website. He gets them from the, the distributor, through Baker and Taylor or whatever. And he, he puts his order in a few days. He can't ship them until the, the day the book comes out. But he, gets, you know, the, he fills his van up with books and drives up to my house with it from Pennsylvania. He and his buddy, they make a day of it out my way. And, and we sign the books. Because when you order the book, you can say, you know, to Matt, happy birthday, R.A. Salvatore. Or I'll just put something in. And so Saturday, we did the e-signing for Karen's Claw. He drove up to my house with 900 of them, and 100 of the last hardcover, and 140 of some other books I had bought on remainder that we could sell cheap, hardcovers for 7 bucks type of thing. So I sat there, and I signed 1,150 books um, on Saturday of last week. And that's kind of cool, because you know, people always say, how come you're never coming to Utah? I do go to Utah. How come you never come into Idaho? You know, I don't know. I don't make the tours. The, 
But if to go the tour where everybody wants you, to, you I'd be on the road 51 weeks a year, and that's not going to happen. So you know, it, it's it, that has actually helped a lot, it, and it's really great when you have guys serving overseas because you can ship to the APOs, right, the Army Post Office. So that's really great when you get all these orders from Afghanistan and stuff. That's very cool. So another question about writing, and particularly your mention of the newer multimedia setup. Uh, how do you see that impacting newer authors? Like, if you're established and have the publishing company relations and can sort of pull rank, and it works very well, I'm sure, and has for you. But if you're newer now trying to come onto the scene in sci-fi and fantasy, how does it work with the newer, wider world? I, I probably don't have a good answer for this, but I'll tell you what I've, what I've learned. You know, now that it's so cheap to self-publish, a lot of people are doing it. Um, that's good and bad. What's good about it is a lot of people who were never going to get a chance can do it, and they can get their book out there. And you can even print, you know, back when I started, if you were going to print a book, you had to print 10,000. The costs were just so unreal if you were under that number of the print run. But now, they change those big web presses. They change right on the fly, you know. I need 73 of this book, boom. I need 15 of that book, boom. And it just completely switches over all automatically. Back before that, they had to shut everything down, you know, put the new plates in and everything. So it wasn't worth it. Now you can go and print on demand at a you know, minimal cost. And plus you have e-books where you can sell them. The problem, however, is that instead of having you know, 50 or 60,000 books a year being printed in the US with self-publishing, you have 200,000. And that means that the, you know, anyone, any prospective readers, how are they going to find you? over the noise of everybody else. So there are people, um, you've, I'm sure most of you have heard of Chris Paolini. He wrote the Aragon books. And he was self-published. His parents self-published him. And they would take him all around the Northwest and go to like junior high schools and stuff to give talks. And he'd be in costume from Aragon. When he, he was like 20 at the time. And they would go all around with the book. And through that, he found a publisher. So a lot of people now, it is so hard to go to a publisher because the book industry, with all the changes, is in such flux. You know, the margins are razor thin. So it's so hard for a new author to find a publisher now. A lot of them will self-publish, try to build some kind of a following, and then try to go the traditional route with that. Um, I don't know how it's working for most. I do have several friends, several of the guys at 38 Studios, actually, I, I edited books for them. And then they, they put them out there on uh, ebook format. So it, it's better because you can be published. <laughs> but I think being published and being able to like, make any money at it is much harder. It was always hard. I mean, it was always a brutal business. But now it's, it's you know, if you self-publish and you sell a few hundred books, it's a lot of work for a few hundred books, you know. Thank you. So. Thanks for coming to Google. Um, I grew up in New England and uh, fondly remember seeing you at a few gaming conventions in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, and you talked about going back in time. One thing that has changed for my life in interaction with the fantasy genre is it's become much more mainstream. Uh, when I yes. was a kid, you know, the, the local churches expressed their disapproval at me playing in the Mad public library. Mad about D&D, right? Remember that organization? <laughs> yeah. And, and today, you know, my sister-in-law in Appalachia plays World of Warcraft every day. Sure. I'm, I'm curious, has that mainstreaming, has that affected you? And I'm curious, how, how has it affected your life and your career? I think it has. Um, I'm not sure yet what the end result of it's going to be. I'll put it that way. But what's really cool to me, by the way, is playing an MMO and then seeing some variation of one of my characters come running by. <laughs> I was playing EverQuest many, many years ago. And I played a character named Thibbledorf, right, the shield dwarf. And I walked out of Kaladim, and I was like a third level warrior or something. I walked out of Kaladim, and some guy was playing a character named Bruner. And so I go, oh, I got, I got to torment this guy. Right? Bruner is the king. He's Thibbledorf's king. And so I ran over to him, and I kept typing in, me king, me king, right? And he's like, he, he, so he would start a fight. And if you remember EverQuest, you could kill Steel. And he was like a first level character. I was third. 
So he would start a fight down and I'd run and I'll save you, me king, and I'd kill steal him. Do that again, I'll report you. I'm saving you, me king. You know, and he's like, what the heck? And this was going on for like a half hour. This poor guy couldn't get a kill. I was just making his life miserable. Finally, he starts running, trying to run away. I'm chasing him across, shouting out in the zone, me king, me king. Leave me alone, right? So he reported me. <laughs> we, get to, we get to Jife. He ran all the way from from Kaladim all the way to Greater Fadark. We get to Greater Fadark, and the GM shows up, and I know him, because all the guys at Sony know me, right? And he's, he sees my account, he's like, Bob, is that you? <laughs> I'm like, hey, Rumblebelly, how you doing? His name was Rumblebelly, the GM, right? Like my halfling character. It was, no, it was Rumble, it was Rumble Tummy. He did a variation of, my, of the nickname of my halfling character. I'm like. How are you doing, Pat? And he's like, what are you doing? This guy's like got this four-page ticket opened against you, wanting you banned. <laughs> and so um, the GM made him milk and cookies <laughs> and made me promise I'd leave him alone. But that happens all the time. I, 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 so I love that stuff. But as far as it going more mainstream, you know, that's hard to, it's hard to say because even still, where it's at is that certain things have made the leap to mainstream, but then they always say, oh, but that's different than the rest of it, right? Peter Jackson does those wonderful Lord of the Rings movies. But that's different. That's Tolkien. That's classic stuff. That's not this fantasy genre thing. And a lot of the other fantasy authors who become mainstream, I'm thinking Margaret Atwood, Terry Goodkind, they're immediately no longer fantasy authors. You don't call them a fantasy author, right? Oh, no, 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 no. I don't, I'm writing speculative fiction, mainstream fiction. <laughs> What? <laughs> Recently, however, George Martin, of course, made the jump with that HBO series, Game of Thrones. If you went up to George Martin and said, you write fantasy, he'd say, you're darn right I do. So, because, and it's mostly technology that's driving it, right? I mean, if you look at the fantasy movies of the 1980s, uh, some of them were pretty good, but, you know, the one, I, the one I keep going back to is Dragon Slayer, which had this wonderful special effects for the time. They just couldn't do the things in the movies to make it as fantastical in someone's mind as the book would be. Now they can. And so with the World of Warcraft, and it's much more accepted, particularly, particularly like on college campuses and in academia. I spent the first 15 years of my writing career arguing with high school teachers as much as anything else, saying, look it. The biggest, the biggest trouble you're having in teaching kids to, to read and write nowadays is distraction. There's so much more for them to do. Everything's coming at them 100 miles an hour. It's not like even when I was a kid. When I was a kid, you know, the big devil to the English teachers was television, right? TV's go no one's ever going to read another book when TV came out. That was what they used to say. And, and I remember when I was over in um, England, with Tom DeHaven, we were being interviewed by BBC, and they said, how come your books are outselling Tolkien's books? They were, very, they were very mad at that. And that was before the movies. The Tolkien books had really kind of fallen off. Then the movies came out, of course, and everybody realized how wonderful they are again, which I'm glad because they're my favorite books. But anyway, Tom told them, he said, because we grew up with television, and so we're doing things in the books that the people before television didn't do. Like, I change point of view all the time in my books. And when I first started doing that, my classically trained editor said, you can't do that. You can't change point of view. I said, why not? He said, well, you'll confuse the reader. I said, were you confused? He said, no. I'm like, he said, well, no, but I was trained to look for this stuff. You're going to confuse the reader. I said, Eric, we're not going to confuse the reader because they watch television. And all television is is point of view shifts. And so the books are faster. And think about it. When, when Melville was writing about Moby Dick, what percentage of his readers had ever seen a whale or even a picture of a whale? So you had to describe it, right? Front to back. That's a big front to back to describe. When Tolkien was writing The Lord of the Rings, he had to describe the dragon. Now if you're writing a fantasy book and you say the word dragon, your reader has the image in his mind already. Okay? So that's one way it's all changed. It's because the whole world's gotten smaller in a lot of ways. Shared experience, shared understanding of what fantasy is. So the book's faster paced because of that. Um, 
So for the first 10, 15 years, I would argue with the high school teachers. The way you teach someone to read is to give them a book that he or she falls in love with. I don't care whether it's Stephen King or one of my books or Terry Brooks or Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman or a, a, a crime book. Give a kid, a teenager, a book that he or she will fall in love with and get out of the way. Your job is done. And I see it all the time. My, my friend has a twin daughters who are dyslexic. And they wouldn't read because it was, it's a chore. And they found the Twilight books. And they love them. And now they're reading like six or seven books a week because of that. Because they found something to love. They, if, when you read that first book that you love and you're so involved in it, that's an experience. It's hard to explain that experience to someone. Now, for me, when I was very young, I used to read all the time. I was reading at kindergarten, and, and I had this collection of Peanuts books, the old Charlie Brown stuff, first edition. Still have them. You can't have them. I'm never selling them on eBay either. These are mine. And my mom had a, I had a deal with my mom that I could bag school as long as I was getting A's. She'd let me bag a lot of school to stay home and read my Charlie Brown books. And, but then as I went through school, they beat the love of reading out of me. I'm in the eighth grade, and they're giving me Ethan Fromm and Silas Marner and Moby Dick. Right? Now, you can argue with me that those are good books. Now that I'm an adult, I'd probably still argue with you. But when I was in the eighth book, those were awful books. They're totally irrelevant to anything in my life. I, really, I don't even remember them. I don't want to remember them. You know, Moby Dick, I thought if you took out about 68 chapters, it'd make a great short story. You know? And then. It was so bad that I actually started college as a math major. I was undeclared, but I was going for math computer science, because that was my strength, was, was math. But then my freshman year of college, my sister, for Christmas, gave me a copy of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. And they were in that little white Valentine slipcase from the 70s, right, from the late 70s. And I'm looking at it, I wanted money, because I had this really nice 69 Cougar that broke down every day, and the car was drain in my pockets. I just wanted money, and she gave me books. What am I going to do with these books? So I kind of threw them aside. Well, a month and a half later, in February of 1978, and, and you said you're from New England. Well, you had to have heard of the blizzard of 78 if you're from New England. Because what happened was, it was a Monday night, and I'm going to bed, and they, the weatherman said that we might get a little snow. And of course, being a student, I'm hoping we get school canceled, right? Even though I was in college at the time, I'm still hoping we get school canceled. <laughs> Might get a little snow. The next day I wake up and I look out and my car was missing. And I freaked out because I thought somebody stole my car. And I go running downstairs screaming, somebody stole my car. And I realized that that little black spot I saw wasn't the driveway, it was the roof of the car. So school was canceled for the week. You couldn't leave your house. There were no roads. You, you, were, you were stranded. In fact, you would be arrested if they found you on the road in a snowmobile. You were stuck. So here I am, 19 years old, stuck in my mom's house. Oh, joy. But I wasn't stuck there because of the Christmas present my sister Susan had given me. And all of a sudden, I went to Middle Earth with a hobbit named Bilbo Baggins, and I read those books like three times, all four of them, in the next week. I couldn't stop reading. And I went back and changed my major at school. You give a kid, when somebody finds that book that gets them, whatever it is, that just pulls them in and won't let them go, there's nothing you will ever teach that person about reading again that they won't teach themselves. So that's how it's changed. And now fantasy, the schools are accepting it, which is really cool and about time. So it's sort of a follow-up to that. In addition to fantasy and sci-fi becoming a lot more mainstream, they've also become a lot more standardized. There's a very, as you were saying, there's a very clear picture now, not just of what a dragon is, but also yep. of what an elf is, what a dwarf is. And yep. it gets emulated almost to the point of aesthetic, like aesthetically being identical. Do you find that constraining? Do you feel that innovation in the genre has gone down? Like, what do you feel about the state of the genre right now? And I think the it? genre is a thousand times better than it was when I started. The reason I started writing books is because I ran out of fantasy books to read. Because back in 1981, I had read the Terry Brooks, the Stephen Donaldsons, the Michael Moorcocks, the Fritz Leibers, of course, Tolkien, and Anne McCaffrey. I was out of fantasy books to read. So I wrote one. Seriously. Now you couldn't have that problem. But back then, I think the genre was actually more standardized by the mid-'80s. Because 
And it, it was very limited because like the, the, the female characters were either damsels in distress or chicks in chainmail. That doesn't work anymore at all. And it's made the genre better because you know what? I don't care whether you're writing about a trip to go reclaim a dwarven homeland or to destroy a magic ring or to land on Mars or whatever. Whenever you're writing a novel, it's about the characters, period. When I got my first rejection letter, at the beginning when, when I was introduced up here, Lemister is known for four things, right? We're the plastic pioneer city where we've got Johnny Appleseed. And I say three things. And the third would be Robert Cormier, who was one of the most important um, 20th century young adult writers out there. I mean, the chocolate war, I am the cheese, the bumblebee flies anyway. These are brilliant young adult novels. He's, he's well regarded and he's still taught in most schools in the country. When I got my first rejection letter, I called him up. Because his phone number was actually in the movie, I Am the Cheese. That was actually his phone number in the movie, and I knew that, because he had come to talk at my school. And I called him up. I said, you don't know me, but I got, I got to talk to someone. I just got this awful rejection letter. And he, he kept me on the phone for like two hours. And what he really taught me was that character is more important than plot. Because you, if you have a really great plot, but your characters stink, no one will care. You have a mediocre book. But if you have really, like, a hero that the people really fall in love with, you give them a hangnail and they're on the edge of their seat. And I think of the only author I've ever read or, or recently read who that seemed to go against that was Michael Crichton because his plots were just, they just grabbed me. I didn't care who the characters were. I just wanted to go to Jurassic Park or whatever. But um, so, you know, whether, whether you're writing a dwarf or a dark elf or even a dragon, there has to be a human aspect to that character that touches the reader or you fail. And I don't think, you know, maybe it's becoming more homogenized, but that's only because it, everything you can do is being done. So it's starting to seem cliche. I remember this great time when EverQuest first came out, there was, um, they had their tear doll, the, the dark elves, right? And of course, they were very, this is our world. We created all of this stuff. And I always got to laugh at that because it was clear that, they were a bunch of D&D &D players. I mean, they were, the trolls regenerated. I mean, it was D&D, &D, right? And one guy who would, you know, you could write your own stories for the characters in EverQuest. He had written his story, and um, he got banned because it was just, he was a wretched drow. I mean, and then the people came back arguing with Sony about, you shouldn't ban him. You know, this drow elves are supposed to be evil. And look at the quests you give them in the game. These are not Drow Elves. These are Tear Doll. They are different. They have their own thing. And, blah, blah. and then I posted on this big fight that was going on on one of the message boards under my own name. And I said, then why do they all have V's and Z's and apostrophes in their name? <laughs> Sony didn't appreciate that. But so, you know, it, if you were to take the, the archetypes, you know, the, the big, the broad strokes, and kind of twist them around. You gotta be really careful how you do it. George Martin does that very well. And he twists them around because by killing everybody, basically. <laughs> Wait a minute, you just killed every character in the last book, and there's another book? Oh yeah, yeah. You know, but, but you can't, if you, if you started having dwarves dancing under the stars and elves mining in dark holes, it's just, it's become so familiar to people now. There's a comfort level of of having a basic understanding of who these character race types are. And that comfort level is very important. Even if it's, you know, China Mieville writing about moth people, right, in Perdido Street Station, they're orcs. There are, the, he's changing the name and the description, but he's using the same archetypes. So you can get away with that. But, there's a, there's a familiarity level in fantasy now because it's been so many books over so many years. I mean, my book signings look like Fleetwood Mac concerts. You've got a grandfather with his son and his granddaughter, and they're all reading the books, right? It's a multi-generational now. And um, so there's comfort food in that. If, if there's an elf in the book, people have a feeling of what that character is. And every now and then, something new will break out. I mean, I know that better than anyone. All of a sudden, dark elves became really popular. 
right after I started writing about Tristan, I got letters from DMs all over the country cursing me because every player in my group wants to play a scimitar wielding Drow Ranger and you've ruined them. <laughs> I said, do what I do. We don't let Drow in our groups. We, you can't play a Drow in my D&D game. Really? Yeah, really. Why? Because they're the coolest monster in the game and I don't want to ruin it. What's the matter with you? Um, but every DM in the country hated me for years on end. So every now and then something will break out. But, you know, being different just for the sake of being different can get you really nowhere. So I, 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 don't, think, I don't think it's a big deal. Thank you. You're welcome. I think we have time for, for one final question. I was personally wondering, how do you keep track of continuity and canon, especially among you know, your series of books and then, as you said, playing in, in other people's worlds? How do you make sure that everything is described properly and get those little illusions that harken back? I don't. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. Um, it's hard. I mean, people come up to me and they start talking about like streams of silver, right? And they start, they start to, oh, that part in this book when, when this happened. And I nod stupidly and pretend I know what they're talking about. I wrote that book in 1988. I've done, you know, 30 books since. I don't reread them every year. Um, but, you know, we do have wiki. The wiki is, is saving me. I, I'll go to Google. I go to Google. And I say, um, you know, uh, Bruner um, Scar. And the search comes up and brings me to a page that'll tell me where Bruno's scar is and how he got it and when it happened. And so it's like the entire fan base is doing your research for you. And they're putting it up on all these little Forgotten Realms wikis all over the place. And this is a true story. Many years ago, I was writing a book called Servant of the Shard. And what I thought was really cool is I have this character who was just a lark. His name's Jarl Axel. And Jarl Axel is, if you're familiar with the literary term deus ex machina, Right? A good example of deus ex machina, the dragon shows up, it's, it's killing everybody in the town. I got a better one, actually. War of the Worlds, right? The Martians show up, they're throwing everything at them, they can't do anything, and then all of a sudden they all die of colds. Right? The, the, the common cold wipes out the Martians. Or, or the, you know, the dragon's ravaging the town and nothing can stop it, and our hero falls down against a rock, the rock moves and he finds a sword that was crafted by the elves of, uh, 3,000 years ago to kill that dragon. So he stabs the dragon and it dies. That's deus ex machina. The gods intervene, essentially. Jarl Axel is my walking deus ex machina. And he would show up in cameos of the books. And no matter what was going on, he had his little Jarl Axel Batman utility belt. And he had something, <laughs> some weird magic item to counter what, was bad, what bad was about to happen. It was a blast to write. But he showed up in all weird places in the books, the first books in the series. And now I'm psyched because he's going to be a main character in this book. And then I'm terrified. Because I've only got four months to write the book. And I have no idea what this guy has for equipment. And I'm looking at this pile of my previous books, and I'm like, oh no. You know, where, which books was he in? Where am I going to find this stuff? And so I was about to call TSR and ask for an extension. But instead, I went online to a message board anonymously, right? <laughs> And I, I started a thread that said, hey, let's do an inventory of Jarlaxle's cool <laughs> items. And two days later, I went back and I downloaded this like 10-page thread. And the, they, were, they were putting in like, it was, it was all footnoted. You know, in, Legacy of the, in, the, in the Legacy, page 227, they talk about this item that Jarlaxle has, and it does this. And I think it, it's hinted that it might do. So I grab the Legacy, and I go to the page, and eh, yeah, there it is. Isn't that great? <laughs> and there it was. That's how I kept continuity. Um, other than that, it's up to, that's, that's like some poor soul at Wizards of the Coast gets assigned, or at Lucasfilm. They, they hire some guy and say, you are the continuity editor. Oh, you know, I've got this great job. And then four truckloads of stuff backs up to his house and dumps <laughs> stacks of books and DVDs and everything else on his front porch. And it's like, here's the new book. Check it for continuity. And he's got this mountain of stuff, the poor guy. Um, but that, so it, it can get problematic. And of course, the real secret to doing long term in the shared world is being able to retrofit things seamlessly and make it look like you planned it all along. Um, we cheat. Not often.
but because we, we try hard to keep things straight. So we start anonymous threads on message boards. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. We'll have a book signing in the back, so thanks for speaking at Google. Thanks for having me here. <laughs>